conference training. My name is Destiny Dunbar and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for Resources. And we also have Eleanor Hines, who is Resources um, Lead Scientist and our North Sound Baykeeper and Glenn Alexander, who is with the MRC. And you're gonna be hearing from us today. This is again, day two of our training. All right, so the agenda for today, this is going to be day two, um, another two hour training. We're going to be going over um, a review of day one. We're going to be looking at some water quality and some more species ID. Um, we'll take a break, do a bit more species ID, and then talk about what we can expect on the beach this weekend. Um, and then this weekend, we're going to be on the beach from May 15th. Um, May 16th. Um, on Saturday, it's going to be Larrabee State Park. Um, and then on Sunday, it's going to be Birch Bay State Park. So do make sure if you haven't already, um, if you plan on attending to RSVP to Eleanor, and you'll get all that information in the follow-up email. And then we'll go ahead and do a review of day one. And um, actually, let's just take a moment and let's drop our names in the chat where we're logging in from, and especially if you were not here on the first day. Um, let's just go ahead and see everybody that's here. These are going to be the folks that you're going to be interacting with on the beach, so it's very important that we all know each other. Perfect. Yep. And again, if you weren't here for day one, that's totally fine. You'll have access to the recording um, and this um, today's recording as well. Okay, so let's get started with the day one review. And again, if you didn't see the first day, that's totally fine. This will all make sense to you after you watch the video, or hopefully this will help you out. Um, so we're going to go over the tides. So the key points to remember, which it's okay if you don't remember all of these, this is just a refresher, um, is that there are two tides, um, two high tides during the day and two low tides during the day. The highest of the high tides is called the high high. The lowest of the low tides is called the low low tide. Super easy to remember. So if we're looking at graph A, the high high would be 8.56 feet. The low low would be negative 1.78. And then if we're looking at graph B, the high high would be 8.48 and the low low would be 1.7. Um, and then again, this is not um, entirely crucial to remember, but it's nice to know that the spring tides um, occur when there are large jumps between the high tide and the low tide, um, generally at the new moon and the full moon and the low, or excuse me, the neap tides um, tend to have smaller fluctuations between the tides. And this is usually at the first in third quarter. So I am actually going to drop a poll here and ask you all some questions. And it's totally fine. This isn't a quiz. It's okay if you don't get it correctly. Um, but which graph shows a spring tide? So again, spring tides have very large fluctuations between the high and the low tide. And then we have a bit of true or false from last time, um, the zero tide, which is this line here on graph A and this line here on graph B. So true or false, the zero tide is calculated by taking the average low tide at that point over the year. And then we just have a bonus true or false. This was not in the review, but um, true or false, low tides are in the day during the summer and at night during the winter. So go ahead. More or less. Give folks a minute. Okay, and then a couple more seconds and I'll close it out. All right, perfect. 
Oh, hey, not too bad. Yes. All right, most of you were correct. It is graph A that shows the spring tides. You see this really big fluctuation between the high tides and the low tides here. And here it fluctuates pretty, pretty heavily, but it's not as significant as these fluctuations that you see here. So graph A is the spring tide and graph B is the neap tide. And then it is true, the zero tide is calculated by taking the average low tide at that particular area um, throughout the entire year. And then it is true that low tides um, are in the day during the summer and at night during the winter. So nice job. So that is our tides review. In one sec. There we go. And now we're just going to do a review, some beach etiquette. Now I'm going to have folks type into the chat, or you're welcome to turn off your mic um, and just share one beach etiquette tip that you remember. And I've included some of these photos from the previous presentation to help jog your memory. So again, you're welcome to either type it in the chat or turn on your mic and let's go over a couple beach etiquette reviews. Yep, leave no trace, leave no trauma, that's right. We wanna make sure that as beach stewards, we are um, working to make the beach as inclusive as possible. Put things back where you find them, yes. All right, that's this picture, fill in the holes you make while you're clamming. Don't move critters, fill in holes if you dig, yep. Yes, it's this picture, try not to walk on the critters. All right. All right, good job, folks. Right, don't let your dogs chase the birds. Scoop the poop if you have a dog or pet, yep. Don't wear bad sunscreen or lotions. That's right, be mindful what we have on our hands when we're touching critters. Um, pick up other people's trash, yes. And look rather than touch if possible, that. Those are all right. Okay, nice job, everybody. So this is just a really brief review. Um, it sounds like you all got most of it. Treat critters and algae with care. Check your hands um, for products. Make sure that we're being really gentle um, and careful when we're picking them up so that we're not damaging them, injuring them, or harming them. Um, don't move animals from one tidal zone to the other. Um, avoid walking on animals. Try and find those empty patches of sand to walk on. Um, we wanna make sure that we're not stepping on anything or harming anything. Gently lift up rocks and put them back the way you found them, um, keeping in mind not to lift anything bigger than the size of your head and just being really careful because we have eggs and critters living underneath those rocks that could get crushed. Um, control your pets, make sure that they are not um, harassing the birds, harassing any of the wildlife or harassing the people. Uh, pick up your pet waste, of course, and pick up your trash that goes with the leave no trace. And do not mount, dry, or preserve specimens. It disrupts the ecosystem and is also illegal to take things from state parks. Um, and Alex, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, yeah, I remember in the last uh, session that we had, somebody said, well, is it okay to take shells off the beach? And another participant very wisely responded, well, it's illegal to take anything from the state parks. And at that time, I was thinking about how, uh, how important the, it reminded me of the talking points that we started out for the whole description of this program but I didn't say anything. And then it's been bothering me ever since that I didn't uh, talk about that because um, uh, when we think about something being against the law, we also have to remember that as speech uh, naturalists, we are not the police. And I, I know that we're going to encounter people at the beach that are obstinately opposed to things 
that we might want them to do. It's like uh, today you hear about in the news all the time, people who, who become quite agitated about uh, having to wear a mask, even though it's quite clear, everybody knows that we need to. And you'll find at the beach that there are dog owners that feel very obstinate about allowing their dogs to chase ducks, or you'll find people who are obstinate about your request to fill in the holes. And so um, in my opinion, as I said at the start of the last session, it's really best for us not to engage with that kind of response. It's kind of like you hear in the news that we're, we're asking the police to not escalate um, encounters with people. Well, we don't wanna escalate things with, uh, with obstinate people at the beach either. Uh, some people we have to recognize cannot be changed. And if we try to change them, they will just become more defensive. Uh, and also at the other session, we said that our suggestion is uh, to inspire their natural curiosity and their desire to do the right thing rather than using the club of, of uh, it's against the law. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, all right, thank you, Alex. And again, just reiterating that as beach stewards, we are not a policing or enforcement body. We are just here to act as an educational resource for those on the beach. So thank you for that reminder, Alex. Um, and now we're gonna take a really brief breeze through the species ID. This is the day one species ID. We'll be going over some more species ID today, but this is just a brief reminder of last week's. So really quickly going over habitat, we have the upper inner tidal, the middle upper, or excuse me, the upper inner tidal, middle inner, inner tidal, and lower inner tidal. And the creatures that like intend to inhabit the upper inner tidal are really well adapted to being exposed to the air. Um, so these are typically gonna have protective structures like hard shells or things that'll protect them from the elements since they are um, more exposed than those in the middle and lower inner tidal. And then if you have the lower inner tidal critters, these are the ones who have some um, protective features, but they're not quite as resilient as the upper inner tidal. So this here is a chitin. Um, it's not necessarily a shell, but it has plates that help protect it from the elements. And then the sea star here doesn't have any type of hard shell or hard body, um, but it does have these um, sections that allow it to cling to the underside of rocks and kind of find protection there. Um, and then you have lower inner tidal, and these are generally your soft body um, critters that lack any protective shells, and they are very vulnerable to the elements. They can die um, if they're moved up into the um, upper inner tidal or exposed to the hot summer air or the cold winter air. And then these are just the various different types of anemones. Anemones are soft tentacled animals that resemble sea flowers. They have, whoop, they have tentacles with stingers to um, help catch prey. Generally, they don't sting humans, so they are fine. Um, and when they're exposed to low tides, they tend to pull themselves in. So the anemones we covered last week are the burrowing anemones, the pink tipped green anemones, pretty self-explanatory. And then you have your aggregating anemones, your painted anemones, also known as your Christmas anemones because of the typically red and green coloring. And then you have your plumose anemones. So those are the ones that we covered last week. And again, don't worry if you don't remember all of these is okay. Um, and then after that, we reviewed echinoderms. So echinoderms include sea stars, sea cucumbers, sand dollars, and sea urchins, and they are characterized by their tube feet. And then we went over a couple different types of sea stars last week. So we have our purple, <laughs> our purple sea stars, mottled sea stars, giant pink sea stars, six rayed stars, and leathered stars. Again, it's fine if you don't memorize all the different types of sea stars. Um, this is just a quick review. And then we have the rest of the echinoderms. So the sand dollars here typically found in the sand where eelgrass is present. Um, we have sea cucumbers, which are soft bodied and don't like to be exposed at low tide. And we have sea urchins, um, which you will typically not see because they're farther out in the inner tidal. I believe 
that is what we have for our review of day one. So now we are gonna pass it over to Eleanor to go over some water quality. All right, awesome. Thank you, Destiny. I am going to share my screen here. And I am... Okay, are you seeing the correct display or do I need to switch it? Okay, <laughs> I'm hearing it's good. All right, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about water quality and I'm actually going to share a little bit about the story of Larrabee State Park um, and the water quality issues that went on there and one iteration of this program that existed at that beach and how it was able to help um, reopen the beach again for um, for swimming and other recreational purposes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what does water quality have to do with the beach. So for starters, who wants to swim or fish in dirty water? Um, I included um, this graphic here from, it's from Skagit County, their Poop Smart program. I encourage folks to um, check them out. They have a lot of clever graphics and other things like that um, to help uh, recreationists and farmers and everybody who contributes to um, bacteria problems on ways that they can help be part of the solution. So, um, this slide is to represent that there are many sources of pollution that are out there and we could do a deep dive into so many of those um, pollutants and their sources. But um, today what we're really focused on is um, bacteria and harmful algae um, at the beach. And so on the um, right hand side here is um, a photo of a water quality advisory posting that was permanent at Larrabee State Park. Um, it has now been lifted, but um, when you go to the beach, always look out for signs like this. Um, that could be an indicator of what's going on with the water quality. And then on the right hand side is a, or sorry, left hand side is a photo of um, someone collecting a water quality sample for bacteria. So first I'll go a little bit into bacteria. And so, um, for bacteria, what we um, usually look out for is what we call indicator bacteria. And so there is a lot of different kinds of bacteria that are out there. Um, I'm sure that's no surprise to many of you, um, but there are specific bacteria that we look for um, that can indicate what the risk of harmful bacteria might be, um, specifically from poop derived from warm blooded animals. And so, um, there's sort of the, the larger circle of like a huge circle of bacteria. And then within that circle, there's um, the fecal coliform bacterias. And then um, E. coli is a smaller one within that. And so E. coli more specifically lets you know that there are, um, if there's a high number of E. coli, then you're at a greater risk that there's harmful bacteria in the water. Um, Whereas for fecal coliform bacteria, you probably um, still have a high risk, but it might not be as high um, as if there's no um, E. coli present as well. Um, so some of the concerns that we have are um, mainly for swimming, wading, um, paddling, and all around just playing in the water, um, whatever that might be, um, as well as harvest harvesting shellfish. Um, so um, actually, Laura, surprise, is, um, who's here today, um, is in the photo on the right, or sorry, left-hand side, um, uh, collecting water samples for Surf Riders Blue, our task force program. And then on the left is, sorry, right, my rights and lefts are all confused today. I am so sorry. I think it's because I have two screens going on. Um, on the right-hand side is Jamie um, doing the lab analysis for um, those bacteria to see whether or not it's safe for people to go swim out at Larrabee. Um, so there are many different sources of bacteria out there. Um, some of the major ones include animal waste, um, warm-blooded animals. Um, it can come from farms, pets, or wildlife. And I'll um, tell you a little story about wildlife um, impacting Larrabee State Park um, a little later in this presentation. Um, it can also come from leaky septic systems, um, as well as leaky sewer pipes, um, or sewage overflows and other things like that. Um, as well as, you know, people recreating in the woods and not <laughs> going to the bathroom properly. 
So um, there are many actions that folks can take. And so um, what we're hoping is that while you guys are out on the beach, if you're able to have that conversation about water quality while people are there, um, it's really great to let people know like what they can actually do and that they can be part of the solution. Um, and so at the top left-hand corner is a graphic from the city of Bellingham. Um, they have a, they as well as, um, uh, Whatcom County and lots of other entities have um, pro ongoing programs to um, help educate um, pet owners on the importance of picking up their own or uh, picking up after their pets. Um, and so in this graphic, I like it because, you know, um, the dog saying good human when it picks up after <laughs> them as they should. Um, and so, you know, it's about um, for in this graphic, it's clean shoes, healthy families, healthy pets. Um, and from our perspective, the thing that I would add to that is that, you know, it is about that, but it also um, leads to better water quality, which means that we can keep our beaches open for swimming. And um, this is an issue near and dear to my heart personally, because I love water recreation and um, our Beaches actually are among the worst in Washington state in, in terms of bacteria. And I would love to see that changed. And I would love to make sure that our beaches can stay open for water recreation. Um, because if they continue on the path they're going right now, they might not stay open um, forever. So um, the first thing on here is properly dispose of pet waste, scoop it in a plastic bag and place it in the trash. And so you guys might be encountering folks from not just the Whatcom County area, but from elsewhere. And they might have different practices where they are that they have been taught to do. But this is specifically what we want folks to do in Whatcom County um, because it seems to work the majority of the time for all of our situations. Um, some other places might have different things in place. There are a few places out there that have like special composting facilities that can handle pet waste. We don't want to flush it down the toilet because our, um, our septic and um, wastewater treatment plants are not equipped to deal with the types of bacteria that are present in um, cat and dog poop and other uh, pet waste. So we want to make sure that people bag it in a plastic bag and put it in the trash. I know <laughs> it feels super wasteful, but you know, you might be able to reuse plastic bags and other stuff like that. Um, um, yeah, yeah, like a quick question. Um, are poop bags available at the state park beaches, if you are aware? That is a great question. Um, I know that there are some um, uh, doggy bag stations around in some locations, but I'm not sure exactly where. I think Gianna is on here and she might have a good idea, at least at Larrabee State or um, Birch Bay State Park. Um, but that's something that we can maybe look into. I'll ask the park rangers um, if they have something. Um, so um, Diane says, as far as I know, no, but there are some at Jackson Road. So that's that's a great thing to know when you're out on the beach. Um, what we can also do is um, eventually we'll have little kits set up that have um, uh, like uh, ID guides and some other things in it, but we can also include um, some pet waste bags in there as well. Um, because I find that if you offer someone um, a pet waste bag, like if you see their dog pooping and they don't look like they're gonna pick it up, oftentimes they'll gladly take it and scoop the poop right after that. Um, so um, picking up pet waste is super important. Um, feeding wildlife um, can create problems with bacteria. Um, wildlife is um, obviously like natural and wildlife is supposed to be there. But the problem with feeding wildlife is that it can create um, a more, a higher concentration of wildlife in a certain area if they know that there's easy food to get right there. And so um, like at Larrabee State Park, we found um, that there were so many raccoons there, they actually impacted the water quality because they were getting food um, from the campers. So feeding wildlife can help, or not feeding wildlife can help um, reduce bacteria loads. Um, if you have a septic system, you can regularly get your septic system checked. Um, and uh, the graphic on the right here 
um, is from the Wacom Conservation District and some of their partners. And they have a lot of tips and tricks for um, best farming, farming practices um, to help folks alleviate their um, impacts on the watershed. Um, but they also have lots of tips and tricks about other stuff as well. And um, as you can see down here, um, it is about swimming, but also about shellfish beds too, because nobody wants to eat shellfish that have been there. So shellfish are filter feeders. And so if there's poop in the water, they're going to filter that and you will end up eating it if you eat the shellfish. So um, nobody wants to do that, I'm sure. So um, you can also always check online before you go to the beach. Um, we'll share, a few links after um, in the post email with this presentation recording um, that let you know where you can go. There's a few, like you can go to the Department of Health, um, Washington State Department of Ecology's beach program, um, Swim Guide, um, Surf Area Blue Water Task Force, and there's a few others out there too um, where you can check and see what the bacteria is at your local beach um, before you head out there. Or um, if you're heading out to the beach to do some beach interpretation, um, it also might be a good idea to just know what's going on before you get out there. And then um, another common thing that uh, came up at Larrabee State Park when they were having water quality issues is oftentimes people wouldn't see the sign, they would go and then their kids would play in the water and then they get out and then they would see the sign. And so, um, the recommendation there is that, you know, the beach wasn't totally closed. It was a water quality advisory um, posting. And so um, our advice is that, you know, regardless of whether there's a water quality posting or not, um, it's always a good idea to make sure that you wash your hands real good um, before you um, eat or do anything after the beach um, to make sure that you don't have anything lingering on your hands that might make you sick. Um, so um, real quick, the story, be, story of Larrabee um, State Park, uh, a number of years ago, let's see, like 2009, 2010, um, the water quality at Larrabee State Park was so bad that the Department of Ecology um, posted a permanent water quality advisory um, sign. And so um, they were trying to figure out what the source of bacteria was. And um, sources of bacteria are always super complicated and not easy to figure out. But um, one of the sources it turned out was um, one of the vacation homes right by Wildcat Cove um, had somehow switched their stormwater drain and their septic drain um, system so that their stormwater was getting treated by their septic system <laughs> and the water that should have been going to the septic system was just flushing straight out into um, Wildcat Cove where people go swimming. Um, this was an error that was made during the construction and um, you know, the owner would have never known had a dye test not been done by the Whatcom County Health Department. And so she had that fixed immediately and we thought that we had our problem solved with bacteria and it turned out, nope, we did not. Um, it did improve a little bit, but um, what it turned out to be was there was, as I indicated earlier, um, uh, what we quickly found, so we started this education and outreach program at Larrabee State Park and what um, these interns found out pretty quickly was that everyone had a story of when they came to the campground within like the first 30 seconds of pulling into their campsite that raccoons were harassing them in some kind of way where they were trying to break into the car or, you know, somebody biked into the um, walk-in sites only. Um, and a raccoon stole his backpack and with his wallet in it to pay for his site and so he had to crawl through the culvert to get his backpack back from the raccoon um, and raccoons were stealing lots of um, pet food and other things like that and so it became really clear that the raccoons were a huge problem and so with some education and outreach um, about securing your food from wildlife um, the water quality ended up improving quite a bit but um, while we're out there, um, you know, we had a booth where we talked to people just walking by, um, but one of the more effective ways was actually by doing these beach walks, um, because everyone wants to talk to you about that cool anemone or that chitin, but when you try to approach somebody to say, hey, you want to talk about water quality, um, people aren't nearly as interested if you um, can't engage them first about something else that's really interesting. Um, 
And so that's a bit about the story about Larrabee. Um, the other one that I wanted to talk about is harmful algal blooms. Um, so there are a number of factors that can contribute to this, um, including climate change. It seems like harmful algal blooms are not getting better, they're only getting worse. Um, there are environmental conditions that can lead to it, as well as um, sources of excess nutrients too um, can also call, cause these harmful algal blooms. Not all algal blooms are harmful, but um, these harmful algal blooms typically have some kind of um, toxin involved in them um, that can make people sick or they can even be deadly um, to people as well as pets and wildlife. Um, so they can be a cause for concern when recreating in the water. Um, and then, so they can also make you sick um, by playing in the water, but um, they can also be very bad if um, you harvest shellfish from an area that has a harmful algal bloom. And so some of the things that folks can do is minimize fertilizer use to reduce excess nutrients. Um, and then uh, a really good recommendation, just like with bacteria, is to check um, the health department, health department's website um, to see whether or not um, the shellfish beds are open for harvest at that time. And just because they were previously open doesn't mean that they're open today. So it's always good to know the latest on um, shellfish bed advisories and what's open and what's not. Um, this photo here is taken from an airplane, obviously, um, as part of the Eyes Over Puget Sound program. And um, you can see one of the um, harmful algal blooms there in a bright color. Um, they don't always, they aren't always visible. So um, I want to caution people that um, just because you don't see any algae in the water doesn't mean that harmful algae isn't present. Um, so just something to consider. Um, and with that, to wrap it up, I just also wanted to quickly throw in marine debris is another water quality issue. Um, and so, you know, being out there, if you, this photo here on the left is um, a ball of fishing gear that got all tangled up, um, but it can also um, entangle wildlife as well. Um, and then there's fireworks on the right here um, that also have a lot of toxic chemicals and other stuff in it. Um, so if you find trash out on the beach, it's always a good idea to pick it up. And I think that is the end of this presentation. And then next, sorry, my screens sometimes do funny things. Okay, um, I am going to share the, we're gonna go back into the species identification. And when I get that shared, Alex, you'll be up on the, um, on crabs. Hey, I'm ready. All right. And I hope that shared correctly, yes? Yes. Great. It says species identification. There, we're gonna start with crabs and hermit crabs. And if you remember that song that I sang last week about how marvelous crabs are, look at that satisfied smile on that uh, beach naturalist there, holding that interesting crab. Let's go to the next slide. So we do have a lot of very different kinds of crabs. And uh, I often find crabs that I don't know how to identify. But some of the things that are the best ways to identify them is to look at the shape of the carapace. Remember that song I sang about the crabs? Carapace, jointed legs. It, it, it was outlining those, those uh, parts of uh, those things that make them a crustacean. And it's the carapace is the largest shell over the back. And uh, it also wraps around the sides. It's the largest piece of their shell. And the shape of the shell will be an important thing. Look at the different patterns and colors. Unfortunately, patterns and colors are often not very helpful because in an individual species, there can be wide variation in color. Uh, crabs have 10 legs. They are decapods, 10 legs, decapod. 
but two of those legs have pinchers, as I'm sure you know. Here in this picture, we've got in the upper left-hand corner, that's our wonderful shore crab, those little crabs that have the very square kind of carapace with the eyes so far apart. You can see the eyes are way out in the corners of the square, as opposed to the one below that, which uh, without looking at it closely, I can't really tell. It might be a, a, an immature Dungeness or a graceful crab, something like that. Um, but it, it's very rounded across the front with the eyes very close together in the middle. Look at the patterns on that one in the lower right. That's an immature uh, red rock crab. Uh, it, and all the little babies look very different. Let's go on to the next slide. Oh yeah, one of the questions we get when we're down at the beach is, what's killing all those crabs? Now that is just a, a static image. So I actually have another example here in my hand. If you turn off the slideshow and, um, and look at me, I'm gonna tip the camera down so you can see this crab that I found on the beach. Let's see if I can get that where you can see it well. Uh, it does appear to be dead, doesn't it? It's not uh, moving or anything, but you can see all the legs. You can see the 10 legs, if you count them, five on each side, two with pinchers, and this broad carapace across the back. Notice this is the kind of shell that's round across the front with the eyeballs very close together, identifying this one as a, as a dungeness, a little baby dungeness. Now, as crabs grow bigger, their exoskeleton, their shell, does not grow. So in order to get bigger, they have to shed their shell. And there's, on the carapace here, where it comes down around the side, there's a, there's a line right along here, and they can crack their shell. There you can see I'm opening it up, and the carapace is cracked there. And you open it up, and there's no meat inside. If this was a dead crab, the first thing is you'd notice that it stinks horribly, but this one doesn't stink because there's nothing rotting inside. You do see the old ca uh, casing from where the uh, gills were. They leave those gill cases behind. They crawl out. They pull their legs out through here, and you know how hard it is to get the meat out of crab legs, probably. And it can be difficult for crabs to molt. And uh, sometimes they lose a leg, but they can grow them back later. And then they leave this sh empty shell on the beach. The crab crawls away, goes and hides somewhere where it can uh, uh, swell up with water. The skin gets stretched out really big. And then the skin turns into the new shell. I think we can go back to the slideshow now, Eleanor. So that is a crab molt. And this thing that they do, you can go to the next slide. This thing that they do is called molting and they leave the molt behind. There you can see the, the shell cracked open like that, carapace cracked. All right, let's go on to the next. Here are two Dungeness crab shells that I found on the beach. The one on the left is a crab that died. And then the shell, uh, the, the, the fleshy parts decomposed and, the sh and this is the carapace. This is the bottom side of the carapace. And you can see how the carapace wraps around from the, from the sides. The one on the right was cracked open and then the crab molted and left the shell on the beach. It decomposed enough so that only the carapace was, uh, well, it was separated from the rest of the shell. And I found that shell. So you can see uh, even if you just have the carapace, you can see the difference between a crab molt and a dead crab. Next slide, please. So another thing about crabs, here's a couple of red rock crabs. I know it's a red rock crab because look at the tips of the pinchers there. They're black. That's a good indication. Also, you notice the points on the outside edge of the carapace. They're very fluted, uh, kind of like, um, like a pie crust around the edge of the pie pan. And those are indications of a red rock crab. 
um, uh, these crabs, this is a male crab uh, giving a hug to a female crab. And what he's doing is he's waiting for the female to molt. They can't mate until, they, until the female molts. And uh, so he'll carry the female around like that, waiting for that molt to happen so that they can uh, mate. And then the female crab is, of course, very vulnerable after she's molted. And so sometimes the male will hang on to the female for a while to help protect the female and uh, his genetic uh, uh, future there. Next slide, please. This is the female crab, and um, it's called a gravid female because it has those eggs, could be thousands or even hundreds of thousands of eggs tucked under her tail there uh, on the bottom of the crab. Next slide, please. Here you can see the difference between the male crab and the female crab. These are two different shore crabs looking at the bottom side that piece of their tail that they tuck up onto their tummy. The one on the bottom there is shaped, I like to say it looks like a lighthouse, and that's the male crab. Now the female crab up above has a very different shape to the tail because that's where she's gonna hide the eggs under there. And I, I was at the beach one time and I was explaining that uh, the male looks like a lighthouse and the female looks more like a, a, your thumbnail. And somebody said, well, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I was told that the male crab is the Washington Monument and the female crab is the Capitol Dome. Next slide, please. So here are some of the crabs that you might see at the beach. See if you can guess which one is the red rock crab. Let's see. Look for those very big uh, fluted points on the shell. Look for the black tips on the on the pinchers. And if you guessed the lower right one, you had, the, oh, look at that, they're labeled. Why didn't I notice that? And then the Dungeness also has that same round shape across the front with the two eyes close together. That other one up there in the right-hand side, um, that's the same species of crab that was being held by that woman in the first slide. I call it a telmesis. Some people call it a helmet crab or a bristle crab. I've heard other names for it. Now this tells us something about the names of, of animals. Common names like, uh, uh, like um, Dungeness crab or red rock crab uh, can be confusing because in a different part of the country or someone that grew up somewhere else might have a different name for the same species. Or uh, you might have multiple crabs that have the same common name. And helmet crab and bristle crab fit into that category. So I use the name Telmesis. That's the genus that this crab is in. Um, so I, I hope you don't get confused. It doesn't matter if you don't know the different kinds of crabs. Somebody comes up to you and says, what's this? Just say, well, what do you think it is? It's a crab. That's good enough. And then you can go to a book or something, look at the shapes, look at, at the markings on it and see if you can figure it out. Here's another example, the shore crabs. We actually have two species of shore crabs. Some people call it a hairy shore crab. Uh, I, I call it a green shore crab. And actually in this picture, you've got uh, um, two shore crabs, very different colors. You've got a purple one and a green one. It turns out they're both the same species. So calling it a purple shore crab and finding a purple crab on the beach doesn't mean you have a purple shore crab, unfortunately. Sometimes I actually have to get out a hand lens and look carefully at, uh, at some of the characteristics before I can tell which species it is. And then there's that other very interesting one over there on the far right. You'll find those down at the beach too, a little deeper in the, in the uh, tide zone and in the tide pools. They tend to need to stay underwater all the time. Next slide, please. Oh my gosh, the European green crab. Invasive, yes, very dangerous. Just like hurricanes, scientists 
have five categories of hurricanes. Well, scientists also have five different categories of how dangerous an invasive species is. This crab fits into category five of invasive species. It can change the habitat. It can eat our Dungeness crabs and our clams, valuable species, as well as ones that we know and love. Uh, and they can reproduce like you could, would never believe. They have started to come into the Salish Sea. We have found some in Whatcom County, uh, especially up at, uh, I was going to say Birch Bay, but it, it's in uh, Drayton Harbor. So it's possible you could find one if you are at Birch Bay or, or even down at, at Larrabee, you might find one. Now, they are easy to identify if you look at the points on the outside edge of the carapace. If you start with the points that are on the very farthest outside and count the points in until you get to the eyeball, if there are five spines, then that's uh, the European green crab. They get to be the biggest ones about two or three inches. Uh, you might find uh, smaller ones or you might find a molt. So what do you do if you find one? Don't take it home. Don't kill it. Don't capture it. At first, when we knew that we were looking for European green crabs, we told people, hey, if you find a European green crab, put it in your freezer and then send it to uh, Department of Natural Resources. Well, they got hundreds and hundreds of crabs, but they didn't get one single European green crab. People were taking that advice and they were killing native crabs. So now we say, what you do is you take a picture of it, you uh, write down careful description of where you were, leave the crab on the beach. If you find a molt, that's okay to take that. But if you find a live one, leave it on the beach and then the, uh, the authorities and the scientists will come back with 150 crab traps and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll find them. Next slide, please. Oh, hermit crabs, <laughs> they are uh, as exciting as, as the other crabs. Very lovable little creatures and very hardy. It's okay to pick up a, a hermit crab. I don't think I've ever been pinched by a hermit crab. There are two different species and those two species are shown here. The, the, the differences are very subtle and it doesn't really matter. Hermit crab, that's good enough. There's another picture there. Uh, in not in, I've never seen this in the Salish Sea. I'm told that in other parts of the world, sometimes these species, uh, those species that live there, will use other objects for, to hide their bodies in as well. So if you see a snail shell, you pick up the snail shell and you look at the the entrance where the snail lives, and if you see if it's a hermit crab, you'll probably see a claw right there. But if the snail is still in there, it'll be covered with a, a little round disc, a little hard round disc that fills the hole. And that's called the operculum. So if you pick up a snail shell and you see an operculum, then you know that you have a live snail. If you see a claw, you have a hermit crab. If you don't see anything, you, you might just have an empty shell, but there could be a hermit crab way down in there too. I've seen that before. People take a shell home. Oh, a nice little snail shell. I'm not killing anything. And they get it home and then they hear this little scratch, 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 scratch in their, in their backpack. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, which one is the adult and which one is the juvenile? Well, of course, it's uh, it's probably pretty obvious. You, I wouldn't ask if it <laughs> if it was if it was the little one that was young and the big one that was that was an adult. This is a Dungeness crab on the left, a juvenile dun Dungeness crab about two inches across. So that's a baby Dungeness. Now the other one is a shore crab. That's an adult. That's a, uh, they only get up to be about one, maybe one and a half inches. This is a small one, but it's big enough and old enough to be uh, reproductive. So you can't tell by the size. All the crabs start out their life microscopic. You can't see them without a microscope. And so the, uh, they all go through all the sizes until they get to their full size. Next slide, please. 
This is that uh, red rock crab that I described before. Look at the variation in the coloration. So uh, coloration and designs on the back. Same thing with the shore crabs. They often have designs on their back too. It, it, it's not indicative of the species. Next slide, please. It's someone else's turn, isn't it? Sorry, I was trying to get to my unmute. Um, thanks, Alex. Um, so I'm going to talk about worms for a little bit, and then we're going to take a five minute break. Um, so sit tight for just a little bit longer. Um, so I know that not everyone is a fan of worms. When I was a young girl, worms were my favorite. I love singing songs about worms. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna sing any of them for you right now though. Um, and they're not as educational as Alex's crab song, um, but you might see some while you're out there. Um, and if you don't see them, you might also see evidence of their presence. Although it's not always clear if you don't see them directly, what that, um, what left um, that evidence of their presence. Um, so there are a few different types of worms that I'll go over, um, but the main types that you will encounter are flatworms, ribbon worms, and segmented worms. And so um, I'll go over ribbon, ribbon worms on the next slide, but um, some of the basic differences between flatworms and segmented worms. Um, just hearing their names is a clue. Um, so flatworms tend to be flat. Um, they also often um, have eye spots that you might be able to see on them as well as like this um, nervous tissue cluster. Sometimes you can see that as well. Um, and they tend to be found, you're more likely to find them underneath rocks um, where they can stay nice and damp. Um, segmented worms, just like their name implies, are segmented. Um, the earthworm is something that um, a lot of folks think about um, when they think about segmented worms. Um, and then ribbon worms are, um, I'll show some photos of what they look like if you haven't seen them before um, in, on the next slide, but um, they have this um, proboscis that comes out um, to help them feed. And they're usually these like long skinny um, worms. They do not have segments and they are not flat. Um, they are ribbon worms. So um, ribbon worms um, are usually found in the rocky intertidal or soft substrate areas. Um, if you're not sure what you're looking at, um, they have really soft bodies that are kind of like long and stringy. And so if they're in a clump, it might look like, you know, uh, <laughs> um, like purple or orangish reddish snot or something like that. Um, and then if you were to pick it up, um, I don't recommend picking them up um, because they are super fragile and they can fall apart into pieces. They can also be extremely long too, um, but they're these kind of like long snotty ribbon worms um, that you'll find out there. Um, and they're, they're pretty cool um, to look at. And they also have those retractable snouts, the um, proboscis um, that helps them feed as well. And so they're, they can be pretty voracious predators. Um, and then there's the polychaete segmented worms. Um, these are often found in the intertidal zone. Um, they might be um, buried in the mud or um, under rocks and other stuff like that. Um, they uh, have segments and they have these feet um, that you can see the pile worm here is a great example. Um, and these, these pile worms, this one here is pretty large. Um, they get really large about up to a foot or so. And then the um, giant pile worm can actually get to three feet long. Um, so for those of you who don't like worms, I'm sure you'll be glad to know that there's a three foot worm lurking out there on the beach. Um, there's also tube worms um, like this guy right here um, with his fan out. And so um, if the tide is out, you might just see um, this, uh, the tube left by the tube worm and you might not realize um, that there's actually, you know, a worm living inside unless you see it like in a tide pool or um, in the shallow intertidal area. Um, and so they um, send out this fan and it helps um, to filter feet or sorry, breathe as well as filter um, food um, that's floating in the water like plankton um, for them to eat. And then 
Um, you also might see evidence of um, other types of two worms that get left behind, like these right here, um, these calcareous tubes um, were found on some seaweed. And then there's, um, again, as Alex was saying, there are many <laughs> different, the problem with common names is that um, there can be more than one common name depending on where you come from. Um, these are sometimes called sandworms or goddess worms. Um, and um, I am terrible at pronouncing <laughs> um, some of the uh, scientific names, but Neftidae, um, I think is this one. Um, they are definitely found at Larrabee. I think that they're also found at Birch Bay State Park as well. Um, and they can be kind of fun to find as well. Um, one thing to keep in mind with these guys, as well as like the pile worms, is that if you do pick them up and handle them, um, they, they do have little um, pincers um, so they can bite. Um, so beware of that. It doesn't hurt too bad, but it's not pleasant. So be warned. Um, also, before you pick up anything, you should kind of maybe know what you're getting yourself into um, and pick it up carefully. Um, here are some photos of flatworms. Um, they, as the name implies, are pretty flat. Um, they're, they have a pretty simple digestive system. They breathe through their, um, their skin and oftentimes you can find them under rocks um, and fish and crustaceans will also feed on flatworms. So if you do find them, try not to leave them out and exposed where um, they might get eaten more easily. And with that, it is 657. Um, so I propose that we take a five minute break, which means we'll be back at um, 7.02, right, Destiny? All right, well, we'll see you then.
All right, folks, it's 7.02. Let's start bringing it back. Give folks a couple more seconds. All right, I think we're good. All right, so we'll dive right back into it and I'm gonna go over amphipods and isopods and then bivalves and then I think after that it might be Alex but we'll see when we get there <laughs> and also due to time some of the stuff especially towards the end we might go over a little bit quicker um, but don't worry you don't necessarily need to know all of your fishes and other things like that that are towards the end um, so um, I also wanted to throw out there too, um, I see some people have been asking questions as we go, um, but if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in or um, you can put it in the chat box and I'll, I'll do my best to see that or <laughs> remind me, Destiny or Alex, if you see something um, that I miss. So um, <clears throat> with that, I'm going to go over amphipods versus isopods and give you an example of each one of those. Um, these are um, little bug-like um, critters, but they um, aren't necessarily the same as the insects that you um, see. So there's amphipods. Um, I tried to find better um, diagrams for them, but um, so I put in little photos too to maybe help you see the difference um, between them. So amphipods um, are laterally compressed. And the way that I think about that is that amphipod starts with an A. And so amphipod, you can think about if that A were, the two sides of the A were compressed together. And so that's how they're, they're compressed. Um, just like this uh, sand flea or beach hopper up here. And then isopods um, are dorsally flattened dorso ventally flattened, excuse me. And so one way that I think about that is like the two um, top or the um, either side of the eye is like flattened. So it's kind of like flattening their back towards their um, stomach. And so um, almost like something stepped on them and squished them flat. Um, so that's how isopods um, usually look. And so there's a rockweed isopod up there. So um, here is a beach hopper. Um, they are also some kind of, sometimes called beach or yeah beach fleas um, because they kind of hop around um, oftentimes around the rack line. Um, we went over what the rack line is last time around, but in case you forgot, um, that's where when the high tide comes in, all of the stuff that's floating around, like the um, algae that's become unattached and um, other debris, uh, might get left. Um, at the high tide line, as the high tide then recedes, um, you get this nice little line that goes along the beach. Um, and because there's usually eelgrass and algae and other good stuff like that, um, uh, beach hoppers um, can oftentimes be uh, found in that area. So then there's isopods. Remember, isopods, I, they're um, flattened this way versus. Um, uh, from side to side like amphipods. Um, so rockweed isopods are often green in color and um, they can camouflage pretty well with their surroundings. Um, sometimes they can be um, a brighter green like this guy or a duller green, but they can also um, come in other colors like a, like reddish browns and other colors like that as well. Um, they lay pretty um, flat. Um, to whatever they're hanging on to, such as rockweed, kelp, or eelgrass, um, but they can off also sometimes be found um, under rocks too. Um, and algae is the mainstay of their diet, um, and they can be found both at Larrabee State Park as well as Birch Bay, and um, they get up to just under an inch and a half long um, for scale. And beach hoppers are usually um, even smaller than that. So now I'm going to go into bivalves, um, which are your clams, oysters, and mussels. Um, so um, you don't need to know all of your different um, bivalve species, um, but we'll go over some of the main takeaways and some of the common questions that are asked. Um, 
And then uh, we also have a handout too. So if anyone is interested in learning more about how to identify different types of um, clams, we can um, we can uh, get those in your hand so you can take a look at those. Um, so this photo here is a gooey duck. Um, and that is a quick reminder of one of the commonly asked questions are, is um, where are the gooey ducks? And we don't really have very many gooey ducks or some people say we don't have any gooey ducks at all in Whatcom County. Um, so people are less likely to come across a gooey duck at one of our beaches, but it's still, they're really cool animals and good to know about too. Um, so um, one of the commonly asked questions that we encounter is what's squirting out of the sand. I don't know if you've ever been to the beach walking along and then all of a sudden, you know, you might be wearing shorts and somebody super rude and just squirts at you, um, but you're not sure where it's coming from. So um, it could be any number of things, but clams are one of the likely suspects. Um, they um, often will hide in the sand, um, but they'll keep their necks sticking out of the sand, sort of like in these photos here. Um, and uh, uh, if they feel threatened or they like feel the vibrations from you walking on the sand, they might retract to um, help protect themselves. And in order to retract, they then need to squirt out water um, to tighten their muscles in. Um, and um, so, um, another cool thing to know too is like if you see these sticking out of the sand, um, knowing that they they could be um, from a clam, um, but it's not always clear what clam it is unless you were to go dig it up. Um, so then there's also steamers and somehow one of the photos, oh, there we go, <laughs> um, disappeared momentarily. Um, so uh, sorry, the formatting got screwed up here. Um, but this is a heart cockle over here. Um, lots of people, those sometimes you can find right on the surface. Um, these um, little neck clams, here are the native ones and the um, Japanese little necks uh, or manilas. Um, I wouldn't get too caught up on telling the difference between the natives and the non-natives. Um, they all taste yummy and lots of people like to harvest them. Um, these guys tend to be found um, by digging. Um, these guys you can also find by digging, but um, you can, you're, you might be more likely to um, see their shells like this on top of the substrate. Um, so they're, they're a lot of fun to find. And the heart cockle too, um, I like that one because if you, they're kind of a fun conversation starter too, because you can pick them up and see why they're called the heart cockle because it's kind of this nice little heart shape um, that you can look at. So some people like that. It's kind of a a cool little thing. Um, so uh, I talked about digging for clams. So speaking of harvesting, um, one of the really common questions that comes up is, or not necessarily question, but might, everyone might not know is like if they need a permit or a license to shellfish or harvest shellfish. Um, the answer is yes. Um, generally, it's a good idea to make sure that um, you look up and see what um, permits you need before you take anything off the beach um, because most things require some kind of permit before you take it off the beach. Um, and also looking at, you know, best practices is also advised. So um, as we, hopefully it's been hammered away in your brains right now that filling in your clam holes um, is really, really important. Um, but folks can also look into like how to properly set up their gear and other stuff like that as well. Um, and then another really important thing too before people go out to shellfish harvest, um, like we've mentioned before, is to always check um, the internet before they go or call their local um, health department or um, sometimes you might see um, warning signs like this. And so always know before you go um, shellfish harvesting to know if there's um, bacteria problems or to know whether there's something like red tide or harmful algal blooms out there. Um, because, and this is, I mean, bacteria will, will definitely make you sick, but 
Um, there's diuretic shellfish poisoning, paralytic shellfish poisoning, and other stuff like that that um, can make you really, really, really sick or can even result in death. So it's really important to know um, before you go. And I know plenty of people who have thought, oh, the water seems clean and fine. And then um, and they want to eat the shellfish and someone goes, no, 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 I think we should make sure that we, you know, check it out or get it tested. And it turned out that it actually um, did have um, red tide or harmful algae in it. So always good to know. Um, <laughs> I know shellfish are really yummy, but um, at the same time, it's good to live another day to eat shellfish on a different day. Um, blue mussels are another one that we can find around here. Um, they commonly will be seen um, on rocks or other hard surfaces like pilings. Um, usually they um, sort of form these like dense um, muscle beds um, that you might see. Um, there's also our, uh, well, there's Pacific oysters and there's Olympia oysters. So Pacific oysters aren't necessarily native to Washington, but um, they are widely found here and are what um, commercial shellfish um, farms usually use. Um, although some are starting to use more Olympia oysters too, which are natives. Um, the, the Olympia oyster populations really took a nosedive um, years and years ago for many reasons, but um, there are some folks, including the Waka Marine Resources Committee, who are um, trying to help Olympia oyster populations come back. And um, one of the interesting things is that um, the Pacific oysters, um, one of the reasons why uh, maybe they're so popular for our commercial shellfish um, folks is that they can get pretty big. Um, I know Drayton Harbor shellfish, um, they, <laughs> they one time saw the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest um, Pacific oyster and it was like 12 inches long or something like that and they went I bet we could find a larger one and sure enough they went out and pulled up um, some of their uh, shellfish and they found um, I think they named him Hank and he was like 14 inches or 16 inches long. So he beat, he beat the record, the world Guinness Book of World Records um, for largest uh, oysters. So we can, we can get some pretty awesome oysters around here. Um, however, the Olympia, I mean, and also they come in smaller, much, much smaller sizes. So if you go to, um, you know, a restaurant and you order oysters, you can get like the little slippers too. The Pacific oysters. The Olympia oysters, however, um, don't get nearly as large and sometimes they can be a little bit more round in shape, um, but they are super, super tasty as well if you ever get a chance um, to taste them. Um, here are some of the other um, shellfish that you'll find around here. There's the eastern soft shell, um, macomas, and varnish clams. And so varnish clams are also non-native. Um, they usually have, they're kind of like whitish purple, like so if you open them up, they look purple on the inside. And then they have sort of what um, some people think look like a varnish on them. Um, they're non-native, but they aren't necessarily considered um, invasive. Um, one of the interesting things um, that I find about varnish clams is that they live in the, the way that they orient themselves in the sand is a little different than um, a lot of our other shellfish. And so um, there's no restrictions on them for harvest. However, I would just always stay away from them because they are the first ones to take up any contaminants um, or toxic algae in the water and they are the last ones to let go of it. So um, if there's any anything bad in the water, they're likely to have it. Um, so I, I generally try to stay away from them, but um, there aren't any restrictions on them necessarily. So, um, and then here, is um, so humans aren't the only ones that like shellfish. Um, there's also like here you can see evidence of um, some, I guess um, here it's called a gull medan. Um, and so um, I'm sure you guys have seen at the beach, um, gulls or other birds might pick up um, clams and bring them up and drop them down onto the rocks so they can break them open um, and eat 
um, the flesh that's inside for a yummy meal. And sometimes they'll kind of find a favorite rock that works really well and you might see lots and lots of um, shells around it. But gulls aren't the only um, ones. There's lots of other critters that eat them out there too. Um, and then over here is actually um, a shell minnow um, <clears throat> left from uh, a while back. It could be hundreds or thousands of years ago. Um, of people who eat shellfish in the area and that was sort of like their after they eat the shellfish that's where they left um, the remains and so we can see some of these shell middens today in some locations um, such as uh, Chuck, North Chuckanut Bay. And with that I will turn it over to Alex. Oh the snails yes. So Eleanor was just talking about bivalves and just like a bicycle has two wheels, bivalves have two shells. Well, as you probably know, snails have one shell, so they're univalves. Let's go on to the next slide. If you have an aquarium or if you can somehow see the bottom of a snail as it's crawling along, it'll have this big gloppy thing called a foot because that's how it moves about. Some people think it looks like a stomach and so they you might call that a stomach foot. So snails are gastropods. Gastro like your gastrointestinal system, your stomach and pod meaning foot. So they're they have a stomach foot and a little mouth there up in the front where they, many, not all, but, uh, but some snails have these a tongue with these little sharp edges on it and they can uh, uh, scrape on uh, things to get the algae and eat the algae or they might even scrape in one place and make a hole in a bivalve and then stick their siphon in there and suck it out like a straw. So sometimes you'll see a, a, a shell, a clam shell on the beach with a very even hole as though it was drilled by, a, by a, a mechanical drill. And that was probably eaten by a snail. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, these whelks, they're very common in rocky areas mostly. And uh, so uh, you will easily find them. And they have very thick, hard shells, and so they are uh, a common shell that lasts a long time and is very good protection for uh, the hermit crabs. So you can often find hermit crabs in there as well. Next slide, please. Now those whelks lay their eggs on the rocks, so it's often uh, it's common that you'll be able to find their eggs, and they look like these little, um, some people say sea oats. I think they look like that. What is that uh, Italian thing that looks like, a, I forget what that's called, Roso, Ros Rosito or something like that. Um, they, they look like that on the bottoms of the rocks. Next slide, please. This is a fun little snail, the periwinkles. Uh, there it is. Uh, uh, Shannon says, uh, Orzo. That's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> those, those lovely little noodle things. Thank you, Shannon. So the, uh, the periwinkles live in the very high intertidal. In fact, they're so used to being um, exposed at low tide that I've found that if you put them into a uh, um, into your aquarium, they'll climb up the side and they'll get to the top and then they'll just stay there they'll, until they die. They'll dry out and die because as the tide comes in and out, they get wet. But uh, in the uh, unnatural system of, a, of an aquarium with no tide, they, they can't live in there. But they're fun snails because they, uh, they come out quickly. So if you put one of those in your hand and you put some water in your hand, or if you have a clamshell and you put some water in the clamshell and put them in there, they'll come out and, and crawl around. That picture on the right, you can see the little feelers sticking out. 
below. But notice the many different colored patterns. So like the crabs, you can't really um, identify them. Uh, often you can't identify them by their color markings. Next slide, please. Oh, this is one of my favorites, the bubble shell. It's, um, it, it is a gastropod. It's a, it's a little different kind than the snails. It looks like a sea slug. It looks like it doesn't have a shell, but it actually does have a very thin shell inside. But the shell is completely covered by uh, the mantle, which is one of the soft parts of, the, of this organism. So it looks like a, sea, like a slug, but there is a shell in there. So sometimes on the beach, you'll find these little shells that are very thin and fragile. You can easily break them with your fingers um, and, and, it, and it's, it's translucent. You can see through it a little bit. And so it's kind of like a bubble and that's how they get their name, bubble shell. They do live as that picture shows in eelgrass. And this is a picture of a large pool, which I think is at Birch Bay and there is eelgrass in there. That's where that bubble shell was found. Next slide, please. Nudibranx and sea slugs, yes. So these are gastropods that have evolved to live without the shell. Uh, there's a very large species over there on the left. The one I like is this one on the right here, the opalescent nudibranch. They have these incredible, uh, they're just so incredibly beautiful. Um, nudibranch, nuda. Bronch, the bronchial as in your lungs. Like if you have a, a bronchial infection, that's in your lungs. Uh, and nuda means naked. So these animals have naked gills. If you remember the song that I said, nudibranch gills are naked, but tell me if you see my crab. Of course, I was hoping that uh, fifth graders would be interested in learning the song because then they get to say naked, but. But these opalescent nudibranchs uh, and other nudibranchs have other means of protecting themselves than be being in a hard shell. So they don't waste their energy building a shell. This opalescent nudibranch has one of my favorites. We've learned about the animals with stinger cells like uh, jellyfish and anemones. And these sea slugs have adapted um, uh, something very remarkable. When, when the animals with stinger cells are touched, their stinger cells are like little springs with harpoons and, and, and they shoot out their harpoon when they're disturbed. But somehow, I don't know how, I, don't, I, I think maybe even uh, no scientists have figured out exactly how they do this. They can eat the hydroids, which are, is this particular kind of animal with stinger cells. But the stinger, but the harpoons don't fire for some reason, and they go through the digestive system of the opalescent nudibranch, and then out into into their serrata, those those uh, feather-like things that are sticking out from the body, and they will implant those stinger cells in their serrata, and then they use those stinger cells for their own protection. We're looking at the bottom of that opalescent nudibranch, by the way. So that's the stomach foot that we're looking at. The top is completely covered with those beautiful serrata. Next slide, please. Limpets are very special too. They are like a snail. They are a gastropod. So if you saw one on the glass of, a, of an aquarium, you would see the stomach foot and the two little feelers out the front. When we encounter them at the beach, Often you'll see them at low tide, in which case they may just be stuck firmly to the rock because they're protecting themselves from being dried out. They can stick on there very tightly, like a canning jar lid. So if you try to pick it off, um, you could hurt it that way because they're holding on so tightly. Also, if you pick it off, they, they can't grab on quickly. So if you try to put it back, they, they may just fall off again. And then they're exposed to predation. Birds would, would come and eat them. Another thing about limpets is that in order to fit tightly, 
uh, I said like a canning jar lid. You'll notice the surface of the rock there is not flat like the top of a canning jar. So how the heck could they stick their shell down tightly? Well, what they do is they slowly wiggle their shell a little bit until it grinds down to the exact shape of the rock there. So that will be their spot. When the tide comes in, they'll go off grazing. They'll be eating algae and things off the rock. But when the tide goes out, they have to get back to their special spot where they fit just right. So if you do pick them off, they may not be able to find their special spot again. Next slide, please. Many different kinds of limpets. You can identify them by the shape of the shell, where, uh, where the peak is, how far the peak is forward or back, um, if there's a little hole in the peak, uh, the, the height of the shell from, from the base. The one I like is that one over there on the eelgrass. They just live on eelgrass. So uh, look carefully at the eelgrass, rub your fingers up the blade of eelgrass, you might find a little bump of the eelgrass limpet. Next slide, please. Barnacles. Barnacles are delightful too. Uh, they actually are crustaceans. So that means they have a carapace and jointed legs and two pairs of feelers, but they're different from the crabs in that, uh, um, well, first of all, they're similar to crabs. When they're little babies, they float around in the plankton and they look for a place to attach. Then, uh, there, yep, there it is. Good, thanks for moving ahead there. There's the little baby. And, and that's, that looks similar to uh, the baby crabs as well. But then as they get older, they need to settle down. So they'll go around and they'll taste the rock. Now, if the rock tastes like barnacle, then barnacles have survived there before. And so they'll, they'll put some glue on their head and stick their head down, and then they never move again. They'll stay stuck in that place. And they, the shell that they build around them is not their carapace, it's a different shell of plates that they have. And they open up those little doors. You can see in that picture in the middle, they have four little doors that, that are closed up. But when the tide comes in, they open their doors and they put their feet out and they eat with their feet. It's like, it's like uh, these little feathery things that are filtering the water for plankton. So a fun thing to do is to take those barnacles and put them in, take the rock and put it somewhere where it can be underwater and then they might open up if the water is cold enough, if it has enough oxygen, and if there's some plankton in there, they might open up and put out their feet and you can see that. But of course, always remember to put things back when you're done. The picture over there on the far right, this is a place where the population of barnacles was so great that they were, they were too close and they had to squeeze in between each other and reach up high enough, grow fast enough to, to compete with the other barnacles on the rock. Now, some of those barnacles have been broken off and you can see that little white mark where it was glued on. Uh, and, uh, and so sometimes you'll see those white marks on things and the barnacles are gone, but you'll know that a barnacle was there. Next slide, please. Mm, I think I'll do the, or talk about the kittens now. Thanks, Alex. Um, Thank you. And so chitons are a lot of fun. Um, they're, they can be a little bit harder to spot sometimes. They can camouflage in pretty well and they'll kind of get covered in, sediment or algae and other stuff like that. Um, this photo down here shows one that's kind of falling off the rock. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but that's probably not a happy chitin. I don't know if somebody tried to pry it off the rock or maybe um, they're not feeling well, but usually you don't see them like that, but um, their underbellies can kind of um, be a little bit more colorful than the top of them sometimes. And I'll show um, what they look like on their underside um, because I recommend that you don't pry them off the racks ever because um, they will not be happy about that. It's similar to all of the other critters that we've talked about. Um, but I think it's important to kind of have an idea of um, what they look like underneath. So um, 
they can, they're oftentimes found in the mid to lower inner tidal, um, sometimes like below rocks or kind of on the side, um, sometimes on top. Um, they can be kind of uh, more camouflaged, like this guy right here, um, the hairy chitin, or they can also be a little bit more colorful, like the gumboot chitin or the lang chitin shown here. Um, and they usually are roughly about three inches or so in length, um, but some of them, like the gumboot chitin, um, if you ever find one of those, they can get up to over a foot in length, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, they have, so on this one here on the hairy chitin, you can see pretty well, um, they have these eight plates that are held together um, by a girdle. Um, and uh, they're pretty well adapted to um, the surf zone. They cling on to rocks similar to um, limpets and some of the other species. They can move around. Um, it's kind of cool if you ever watch them. They um, don't move very fast. It's almost like watching a sloth, um, but uh, it's pretty cool to watch them move around. Um, same with limpets too, um, if you ever get a chance. Um, and uh, the other thing too that I wanted to note is that a lot of them look pretty similar. So don't get caught up in trying to tell the hairy chitin from the mossy chitin from the line, lined chitin um, because it, it can get pretty tricky, um, but all chitins are pretty cool. So as I mentioned before, here's the underside. Um, and again, I don't recommend it. This poor guy might be dead or certainly not very happy. Um, being shown in this photo right here. Um, but luckily there's a photo so you don't have to go out and pry one off a rock um, to see what it looks like underneath. Um, so here is the foot. Um, you can also see the gills on the sides and there is the mouth right there. Um, and um, so uh, one of the tools that some beachcombers like to have on hand that um, we will try to have on hand for you guys too um, are toothbrushes. Um, so uh, sometimes they can sort of blend in and be covered in um, lots of stuff on top of them um, like algae and sediment and so they just kind of look like a brown blob and then once you um, brush them off like uh, beach naturalist Linda Schroeder did here for the photo to tell what kind of species it was you all of a sudden get to see all of these kind of fun patterns um, at the same time with any critter when you disturb them um, just think about what you're doing before you do it um, if you're, you know, suddenly exposing them and um, decreasing their ability to camouflage or leaving them high and dry um, and more exposed to like the sun and drying out, um, maybe consider um, putting some algae back on top of them or something like that afterwards, or, you know, gently rolling the rock back into place. If it's, again, don't touch any rocks that are larger than your head um, kind of thing, but, um, you know, just think about, what you're doing um, so that you can minimize your impact on them. And then this photo here is a mossy chitin and I just wanted to show it because I think it's pretty cool with all those spikes um, that are around it and you can kind of see some of the fun patterns that are on it too. Um, so these are these are fun and if you um, uh, when I've done this before or been out on the beach um, leading groups sometimes it can be kind of fun to see um, how many chitons or something um, kids can find because they're a little bit more camouflaged and it, it, it gets them kind of excited once they start finding them. Um, shrimp are another thing that you'll find out there. They generally aren't found out of the water. If they're found out of the water, they're probably not so happy, but um, you can still see them in tide pools or just below um, the tide line sometimes. And so one of the common ones that you might see out there is um, commonly called the broken back shrimp. Um, as the name implies, it kind of has this like, it looks almost like it's got this broken back um, shape to it. Um, they can come in a variety of colors. They're oftentimes translucent. Um, sometimes they can be green like this one here, but they can also um, be more of a brownish color and um, you might see them out there in different colors or look almost totally clear. Um, 
they oftentimes uh, will be found like in areas with seaweed. They grow up to about an inch long um, and are just kind of cool because people eat shrimp at restaurants, but you know, not everyone always um, has seen them out at the beach before. And these are definitely not the kind of shrimp that you would actually eat at a restaurant. Um, they're a little bit on the small side, but um, still fun to see. And um, fish are another one that, um, again, typically aren't found out of the water, um, although I'll get to that um, in a few slides, but um, they're usually found um, in tide pools. And so they all need to be well adapted for um, potentially low oxygen situations and being in warmer water as tide pools can sit there for a little while longer and you don't get that um, fresh oxygen and cooler water um, that's associated with, you know, being out in the actual marine water versus the tide pool that might be cut off from it. Um, and this photo here, just so you know, this is from doing um, green crab surveys and some of the um, local fish that we found. Actually, I think this was taken at uh, North Chuckanut Bay from one of Chris Brown's green crab surveys, I think. Um, so sculpins are one that are commonly found around here. Um, some of the two more common ones are the typhoon sculpin as well as the staghorn sculpin. Again, they can be pretty tricky to identify. So just identifying them as sculpins is, I think, just totally fine. They can also camouflage really well. Like, I don't know if you notice this guy right here. Um, they are usually characterized by, they have pretty flat bellies and they have these pectoral fins that kind of lay flat on um, the sediment or wherever they're hanging out. And then um, they have these bigger heads and then they, they quickly taper off into these skinny bodies down to their tail. Um, and some of them too sort of have these like um, saddle stripes too going down. And then um, we're not gonna actually quiz you guys, but one of the other commonly asked questions that we get are um, includes, is this an eel? Um, so a lot of people think that they found an eel out there. Does anybody know, is this actually an eel? You can shout it out or put it in the chat box before I move on to the next slide. <laughs> I see Alex quietly shouting out <laughs> the answer. So um, typically we don't really have eels around here, um, but what people usually see when they think they're seeing an eel is a gunnel. Um, it could also be um, what are called um, blennies too. Uh, they're these narrow fish that have, um, their bodies are shaped pretty similar to eels, but they get, they still stay um, pretty small um, and they uh, can be pretty cool to find. And usually they'd be in tide pools or just below um, the tide water. But um, I think sometimes they can also be found under rocks or in, um, in other cool damp crevices in the intertidal zone as well. Um, and so this guy here is a sand sole. Um, we just know it's a juvenile flatfish when they're this small. Um, it's hard to tell whether or not exactly it's a sand sole, um, but it is some kind of floundery fish. And you can see it's got two eyes on the one side. Um, sometimes you might even see when they're um, younger and they actually still have their eyes on either side of their head and their, um, one of their eyes hasn't migrated over to the other side of their head yet, which is kind of neat, or you'll see it kind of <laughs> in process. Um, and so um, they also blend in pretty well. Um, but uh, they, I think this one in particular was found um, somewhere in the shallow intertidal um, zone area. And there were a lot of these little guys all out at the same time. So if anyone has ever come across a midshipman, these are super, super awesome fish to encounter. Um, but we have a few cautions that go with them. So um, sometimes they're mistaken for sculpin because they have a similar body shape. Um, they uh, can hum. Um, and so uh, sometimes 
you can hear them out on the beach. Um, I've never heard them, but I've heard it, it's a pretty, pretty interesting sound. Um, they also have these um, photophores that um, on their bellies, which gives them the name midshipmen because they have similar um, buttons as midshipmen do on their uniforms. I guess in the British Army, um, but they can also produce light when in deeper water as a way to attract prey too. Um, so as shown here, um, these fish are a little unusual where when you think of fish, you wouldn't think to look under a rock that's high and dry for a fish. And so sometimes people meaning well, um, turn over a rock and then they go, oh my gosh, there's a fish out of water. I better save it. So they pick it up and try to put it back into the water. However, um, this is not something you should do. So um, in this photo, this is the same midshipman here. Um, and you can see um, here's the adult midshipman. And then here are the eggs that this midshipman is protecting. And so you don't wanna put him back in the water because um, you'll be separating him from his babies and um, nobody wants to be separated um, from, their, from their young. Um, and he's well adapted to live out of water um, for periods of time so that um, these adult fish can then guard their young. And so um, the other thing along with this is, you know, this is, this is an adult guarding their nest. And so um, we don't wanna overstress them. This rock probably shouldn't have been turned over. It's all, it's larger. I think it's larger. It's hard to tell the exact scale here, but it's probably larger than someone's head. And so this is another reason why we um, suggest that you don't pick up rocks that are larger than your head um, because you might find a midshipman under there. And when you get a larger rock, it's harder to control that rock and we, we don't want you crushing the poor adult fish as you're trying to move it um, or put it back. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind, but these are definitely really cool fish um, if you ever get the opportunity to see them out there. And then I'm gonna talk about marine birds for a little bit. So um, I won't go into too many details with marine birds, um, just some of the highlights. Um, there is a recorded training that we will share the link to on migrating marine birds, but um, those are typically seen throughout like more of the winter time. Um, so we won't worry about those here, but um, what we will <laughs> go into about is um, goals. So um, some of you bird nerds might know that there are so many different types of goals out there. Um, however, some of you might not. So um, if you want to take a deeper dive and learn all of your different goals, then go for it. I encourage you to do so. Um, if you don't want to, just calling them goals is totally, totally fine. Um, it suffices plenty. And uh, one of the more common goals that's found out there is the glaucous wing goal. And one of the interesting things about um, them is they have this red dot on their beak. And um, it's thought that their, their young will peck at this red dot um, to force their parent to regurgitate their food to feed them. So um, for young seagulls, this triggers feed me, um, which I just think is super interesting. The other thing about goals too that you might observe while you're out there is sometimes they will feed on um, sea stars. And so um, it takes a really, they can't swallow, um, like especially the larger um, purple sea stars all at once. And so sometimes you'll see them kind of laying there with like a few um, sea star legs down their throat. And the thought is that that helps start the digestive process so that eventually it starts breaking down and then they can swallow the whole sea star. Um, but it sure is, um, a long process um, <laughs> to eat those sea stars, if you've ever watched them. Um, crows um, are another common bird that you'll see out there, not to be confused with um, ravens. Um, they eat all kinds of stuff um, and they can hang out on the beach. Um, great blue herons are another one uh, that you'll commonly see out there. They're really fun to watch. Oftentimes you'll see them standing on their stilty legs, um, 
staring at the water until they they see their prey and they'll set they'll um jab their sharp beaks in the water and uh come up with a fish if they're lucky um for a meal um and they also eat other stuff than fish i've seen them eat rodents and other things like that um there was a lot of fun to watch and with that i'll hand it over to alex to go over seaweeds and plants yeah seaweeds and plants well that's a little bit complicated title um seaweeds are really anything that's growing under the water uh, plants, when I was in school, there were animals and plants. That was the only two kingdoms there were. And so plants included seaweeds too at that time. But uh, now we recognize the differences and we'll get into that. Next slide, please. So uh, the seaweeds are categorized into three different groups, brown, red, and green. And these different groups do tend to survive in different tide zones. And so, like we said at the first session a week ago, you can stand back and look at the beach and see stripes. You might see stripes of the sizes of the rocks. You might see stripes of uh, algaes or, or anything like that. But the algaes do that as well. Next slide, please. Now, some people do harvest seaweeds, and this uh, graphic is showing you how to do that without damaging the seaweed, without killing the seaweed, rather. Obviously, it damages it, but, uh, but they can still grow back, generally, if, uh, if it's done correctly. One of the things that, that uh, interests me about that, the bull kelp there on the far right, they say cut off those fronds at the top, but leave this on the beach. Well, if a bull kelp is, is on the beach, then it's probably already dead anyway, um, because they grow in a subtitle habitat. They, they're not exposed at, at low tide, but they do wash up on the beach sometimes. And uh, so I think leave on the beach is a little bit of a misnomer. They mean if you're harvesting it, uh, leave them where they're growing. Next slide, please. Oh, they, uh, seaweeds, uh, algaes don't have roots. Roots are something that evolved in terrestrial plants, but they still have to anchor themselves. And so they have these little tendril things with uh, that, that can be glued onto a rock or something solid at the bottom. And that's called a hold fast. Sometimes you'll find one like this one washed up on the beach. You don't see any other part of the algae. You might wonder what that is. That's the hold fast, probably of uh, one of those bulk helps. Next slide, please. Sea lettuce, it, it kind of looks like lettuce that's been left in the bottom of the refrigerator too long. It's, it, it's very thin and slippery. It is edible as most of uh, the algaes are edible. There are cookbooks, you can look for that if you're interested. Um, uh, this one, I think it's only two cells thick. So it's very thin, you can hold it up and, and uh, it's translucent, very interesting organism. Next slide, please. Oh, well, what the heck am I looking at there? Oh, I guess this is a slide of the of the ulva, the that that sea lettuce. Sometimes it grows uh, very thick on the beach. Sometimes it'll it'll wash up from other locations and be so thick that it can kill things that are on the beach. But sometimes it'll grow very thick, like you can see here in this picture. Next slide, please. Here's that bull kelp. There's one washed up on the beach. As you can see, those long fronds at the top. The way that these the, the bull kelp works is that it has that ball at the top of its long stem that has gas in that, and then it can float because obviously the bull kelp needs to be up at the surface of the water in order to photosynthesize. They grow sometimes in very deep water, and, uh, and, and so they have to be able to reach all the way up to the surface. An interesting thing about bull kelp is I've heard that it's the quickest growing plant uh, in the world in some cases, because 
They are annual, meaning that they, uh, that they, they die back every year and they grow that entire length at the beginning of their growing season. And some of them can grow up to 80 feet. They'll grow up to two feet in a day to get up to the surface. Next slide, please. The rockweed is also a brown algae like the bull kelp. And it, but this one lives very high in the tide zone. So they're exposed uh, most of the time. So it's very common for us to see these rock weeds. You can see at the bottom of the picture there where it's attached to the rock. So that's where the hold fast is. And then they have those uh, little um, balls out at the end that help it to float again to get ex exposure to the sun. And that's also their reproductive parts. Next slide, please. The red uh, seaweeds, these are some good examples. One that I like to look for is that one in the middle there, the nori. Um, uh, it's also called porphyra. It's, uh, it's called nori when it's food. Perhaps you've eaten it. If you've eaten the kind of sushi that's rolled up in a seaweed, that's usually the species that's used for that. It grows in these large flat sheets and it does grow here naturally in the Salish Sea. I'm also really fascinated with the Turkish towel, the Turkish wash, washcloth, called that because of those little bumps on them. It's kind of like the terry cloth uh, bumps on the towels that you use in your bathroom. Very easy to recognize from that. And then this iridescent one on the far left is so beautiful when the sun is shining. It, it, it has these rainbow colors. It doesn't show up very well in the picture, but it's, it's almost like, uh, like, like when there's an oil sheen on the water and you get those reflective colors. It's very, very interesting and beautiful. Next slide, please. And then uh, eelgrass, which is actually a vascular plant. It's kind of like how um, uh, mammals evolved on Earth. And so they have uh, terrestrial structures like, um, like, like giving live birth and, and warm blooded and things that are, uh, that are adaptive in a terrestrial setting. Well, the first plants, developed in the ocean and they were algaes. But then some plants migrated into the terrestrial habitats and they developed these terrestrial structures like roots that would, that would go down into the soil to pull up the nutrients and vascular systems that would, that would uh, transport the nutrients from the roots up to the leaves where the photosynthesis is happening. And then um, the mammals, the marine mammals, have moved back into the, uh, migrated back into the marine system. So they still have those terrestrial structures just as this eelgrass does. Eelgrass has flowers with pollen. And uh, I've always, I'm always looking for the bees with scuba gear that are under there pollinating the flowers, but I haven't found any of those yet. Next slide. I think that's it for the species IDs. So um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what to expect on the beach. Um, I'm happy to talk about that, but Destiny, if you want to go for it. Oh, it's all you, you got it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I'm actually gonna stop sharing screen. Um, so some of you might be wondering about what are some of the next steps. Um, so I apologize that we are doing this over Zoom. It would be a lot nicer in person, but of course um, it seems like there's always a lot of learning. There's different ways of learning. And so um, going over stuff where you can see photos and you know that you're gonna have photos rather than being out in the field where you're being a little bit more opportunistic. Um, there's pros and cons to both. Um, so we've had these two online trainings and the next step is to get you guys out on the beach. Um, so some of you have already RSVP'd for this upcoming weekend for either Larrabee State Park or Birch Bay State Park or both. Um, 
if some of you one beach isn't enough um that's great you're welcome to come to both days um one of the things that we're going to do is um send you an email tomorrow that will have um a link to the recording of this if you want to watch it again if you missed the first half or something like that um you're welcome to do that we'll also have links to a bunch of other materials and then um, we're actually giving you guys homework assignments um, so you will be assigned a few critters and um, what your task is is to um, read up on that critter we'll send you a pdf um, that has a nice little story um, very short story so it's not like you're you don't have to read a novel don't worry and you don't have to do a ton of research um, but we just ask that you read through that PDF. You can do um, supplemental uh, reading if you want on that critter. If you want to learn more, that's totally fine. Um, but the bare minimum is that you read through that. And then when we get out onto the beach, um, what we hope to do is to do something, do um, an each one teach one exercise where um, we'll give you a little bit of time to kind of mosey around the beach and find your, your critter or critters. And then um, we'll all come back together and then um, we'll break out and, or sorry, we'll then sort of do a mini tour around the beach and you get to teach everyone else um, about the critters that you found to, um, uh, help practice some of your beach interpretation skills. Um, and we'll do a couple other um, trainings too out on the beach, a couple of other exercises, excuse me, um, to help prepare you guys um, to get out there. And um, we will also be sending out a schedule um, for you to sign up um, for different upcoming low tide events. And so um, in that schedule, we've highlighted the um, extremely low tides that we would love to prioritize but if those don't work for your schedule there'll also be a couple other ones out there um what we're hoping to do is that especially in the beginning um we'll have a few of us um out there to help you get started and feel comfortable um because it can feel i recognize it can feel extremely awkward when you just go out to the beach and then you're supposed to talk to people but um Figuring out the ways, like the nuances of how you approach people out there is something that um, we hope to help you guys with um, in the upcoming uh, trainings out on the beach. Um, so with that, um, it's 7.58. Thank you so much for tuning in. Destiny, Alex, did I forget anything? Uh, no, I think you covered everything. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right, I'm not seeing any. I think we're good, yeah. Maybe people can turn on their video cameras so we can see what they look like and, and wave good night. <laughs> I know, that's what I miss about in-person trainings. I don't get to see your faces. <laughs> your beautiful faces. Good night, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Good job to all of you. Good job. Thank you. Except for, except for the singing part. <laughs> uh, that was great, Glenn. I went to I went to YouTube, Glenn, and saw it. It was great. Oh, good. <laughs> In your younger days. <laughs> I, I saw you mention that. I, I, I didn't notice that I'd gotten older. <laughs> well, you were I, very animated. It was sweet. I hadn't noticed either. <laughs> All right. Night night. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thanks, everyone. See you there.